Hello my beautiful co-creators, Lilu here on the beautiful islands of Hawaii and today I'm on Maui in Haiku, a delicious place all the way up north and it's really exciting. We're up in the mountains actually right now, aren't we? On the edges of the mountains, yes, <laughs> yes, on the flank of a volcano. <laughs> yes, yes. Very excited to have this conversation with you, Harriet, because you are considered as a, a primal scientist, which is really interesting. I want to speak about also the sun, about our origin, but let's start first with the primal. What is primal scientists and how did you, why, why are, you, are we using more and more this term now? Well, actually, the term primal science came to me a few years ago because I was, uh, I was really struggling to try to talk about things that classical science ignores. And, uh, and there are things that we really need to pay attention to, but classical science can't pay attention to them because classical science is a big institution, you know? Uh, it's a billion dollar industry that's in bed with the pharmaceutical industry and in bed with the military industrial complex, and it's how people pay their mortgages and put their kids through college, and it lacks flexibility because it's a big institution. And so it can't address many of the issues that need to be addressed, the more primal issues, the issues um, that we were talking about a few minutes ago life force I mean you live on a volcano in the middle of a jungle and you're aware that there is such a thing as a life force but science is not able to address the life force because it isn't a substance you can't measure it you can't weigh it uh, if you divide it up into pieces which is what science does in order to analyze and figure out what something is made of as soon as you divide the life force into pieces it's not alive anymore it's dead it's like when you dissect a frog to find out about the parts of it. You end up knowing a lot about a dead frog, but you don't know anything about a living frog. Mm -hmm. So I want to address the living issues, <laughs> um, and I want to address them scientifically. I don't want to uh, dismiss science, but I also don't want to continue along this path of trying to learn by breaking something down into smaller and smaller parts because the vitality gets lost. Hence the word primal science. So what do you what do you try to measure? What do you what are you looking? What are you researching? What is your I know you have a website called Pass Passenger Planet. We're all passengers on this planet. But what are you really trying to measure within this life force or how things function in the universe or not so much measure as um, monitoring and tracking. Um, for example, um, where this all really started for me was um, astronomy. When I was eight years old, I'm 68 now. When I was eight years old, I started studying astronomy just on my own. Okay, And I didn't become an astronomer because I didn't think a girl could become an astronomer. <laughs> uh, you know, I grew up before women's lip. And um, I have no regrets about that, though. But anyway, um, one of the things that I began to realize as I was studying astronomy on my own, outside the system, outside the institution, is that you don't have to measure your age in years. You can measure your age in miles. Because what astronomers, what, what you and I call a year, is actually an orbit. Mm -hmm. A year is just an old-fashioned word for one orbit of our planet around the sun. Mm -hmm. And one orbit of our planet around the sun is 600 million miles. Mm -hmm. So you can measure your age in miles instead of measuring it in years. And um, when you start thinking of your life as a journey around a star, it's a very different experience mm -hmm. than if you think of it as, uh, than if you think of uh, time as something that's going by. Mm -hmm. You know, birthdays don't come and go. We orbit through them. Mm -hmm. Time doesn't pass. We orbit through it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, the scientific community is not particularly interested in these kinds of issues because that's third or fourth grade level si science. It's introductory science. It's about third or fourth grade when we started learning that the Earth is orbiting the sun and blah, 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 you know? Mm -hmm. um, but when we realize that a year is an orbit, then we realize life is a journey. And all the spiritual teachers have told us forever, life is a journey. And the Western world has interpreted them as speaking in metaphorical terms. That's not a metaphor. We are on a journey. 
it's called a year. <laughs> year after year after year. It's a journey around the sun. And the whole time we're traveling around the sun, the sun is making this journey around the center of the galaxy. And the whole time that's happening, the galaxy is doing something else that they haven't tracked yet. So what fascinates me is this idea that we're on a journey, literally, not just metaphorically. And when we realize that science can shine a lot of light on this journey, then we can realize that a lot of the ancient spiritual teachings are much more than just metaphorical. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where I'm coming from with this. That's mm -hmm. how I kind of got started with this, is by studying astronomy when I was eight. <laughs> that is so amazing, so juicy, because that really opens up the whole conversation, and I could totally see by incorporating that, or if scientists would open up to that, then they would create a radical shift within so many minds, and we could live differently, wouldn't it? We would start living very differently and not so. taking this for granted and not making the same decisions. Yes, I think so. Because as long as we assume that time passes rather than we're the ones on this journey, mm -hmm. <laughs> then we're not participating in the journey. We're not co-creating. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, as long as we think time is happening to us mm -hmm. or life is happening to us, mm -hmm. we're not co-creating. We're not participating. But when we realize we're on this journey, and it's obvious that we're on the journey because as we journey around the sun each year, the star scenery changes. If you pay even just the slightest bit of attention to the star scenery, you notice that as we orbit, the scenery goes by. The star scenery that you see in July, you know, uh, it kind of goes behind you there in the west as you move on to August, and the different star scenery comes into view in the east. And you just watch the star scenery going by as you orbit. And it's very obvious that you're on a journey, but people don't look at the stars anymore. Mm -hmm. In ancient times, people looked at the stars. Mm -hmm. The stars were their calendar, mm -hmm. their clock, you know. Um, and, but in those times, people didn't really know that the Earth was orbiting yet because the Catholic Church didn't want anybody to know that. The Catholic Church wanted everybody to believe that the Earth is standing in one place, you know, and uh, that gave them this model of fixed authority. <laughs> Uh, but now we're kind of recovering from that, and we're realizing, oh, the Earth is orbiting, but we haven't yet that incorporated that into our daily lives yet. Mm. What, is, what would you say our relationship to the sun is, and what is the importance of the sun here in this lifetime for us? The importance of the sun is we eat the sun. Mm. <laughs> All the food that you eat is sunlight mm -hmm. that has been downloaded by plants and until they step it down, step it down, step it down into living matter, edible matter. And it's not just edible matter, you can build houses out of it and, <laughs> and other things too. But the only thing we ever eat is the light of the star that we're orbiting. Mm. Uh, and what makes it edible is these amazing things called green plants. Mm -hmm. Scientists have very little understanding of how it is that green plants are able to take light and make it into substance. Mm -hmm. And it's not just dead substance, it's nutritious, life-giving substance. Yeah. <laughs> so, the sun, so the sun transmits some information, some something also to us. That's a really interesting way of saying it. I never thought of it that way. Bless you. <laughs> uh, no, well you could call it information. Um, yeah, I, I never thought of it that way. Yeah. It must be information. <laughs> information about life. Yeah. Um, because... I have a friend who's a poet, and um, he became, uh, through our conversations, he became very interested in photosynthesis, because I had been reading about it, you know, and, uh, and he got interested about it, and he, and he wrote a poem, and his poem was called Photosynthesis, Where Light Becomes Life. Mm. And I had never thought of it in those terms, because I'm not that poetic. Mm. And I've spent too much of my life reading science books, and scientists don't use those kinds of terms. <laughs> but when I heard his poem, I realized, oh, you know. And now, as you're asking me that question, I think, yeah, that's worth considering. Mm -hmm. What is the information coming from the sun mm -hmm. that the plants are able to translate mm -hmm. into the language of life? Mm -hmm. It's a great question. I'd love mm -hmm. to talk to you more about it. <laughs> <laughs> I've interviewed some people about it, and, and that's why it came about, and also the information that we're receiving from the sun, ourselves, too, since we're right. made of light. Right, right. We are. Where, where would you say we're coming from? Who are we? What are we made of? 
Um, well, I can tell you, then this is a scientific fact. The calcium in your bones, the iron in your blood, the oxygen in your lungs, every element in your body except for the hydrogen was originally created in the cosmic furnaces that we call stars. Mm. And then exploded out into space and uh, da -da -da, ended up in our bodies, which means that we're on the earth, but we are not of the earth. And the spiritual teachers have been telling us that for a long time too. Mm -hmm. Not using scientific evidence to back it up, or what we would regard as scientific evidence, but for all the spiritual teachers have always been telling us, you're on the earth, but you are not of the earth. Mm -hmm. Don't get too attached to the earthly stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just like, it's like your earth suit. It's not who you are. This thing that we call our bodies is like our earth suit. Yeah. And you have to wear this earth suit if you want to have an earthly experience. As I said before, the calcium in your bones, the iron in your blood, every element in your body except for the hydrogen was originally created in a star and exploded out into space and uh, ended up as the earth and, and as our bodies. So we are of the stars. We are made of stars. And I should explain, uh, I mentioned that every element except the hydrogen mm -hmm. uh, was created in a star. Uh, the hydrogen was created at the Big Bang and nobody knows where that came from. <laughs> um, so we are of the stars, we are of the Big Bang, and um, that's a scientific fact, but the implications of that fact are not being explored by science. They can't be explored by science um, because it isn't going to translate into patents for pharmaceuticals or <laughs> patents for iPhones, or <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. um, but there's a lot of implications to scientific discoveries that have been made in the last century or so mm -hmm. that the scientists can't explore. But the rest of us can, mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think we're quite eager to. Yes. <laughs> we just have to find a language. We don't want to be disrespectful to science, but we do want to move a little bit beyond it because it's such a big institution, it's not flexible anymore. It can't go <laughs> off in those other directions that aren't going to result in patents or inventions or money-making returns, you know. So, so that implies quite, uh, well, huge changes and, 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 and some huge things for us as we live our reality, as we're taught and as we experience things in this life. It puts everything in, in a whole new perspective right now, which I feel this shift is about, too, where we're opening up to r our real potential. How do you see us as a species? How do you see us evolving? How, where do you think we are and where are we heading? Knowing and starting to knowing and understanding what we start to understand now and see. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a huge question. I don't know where we're going, but I can feel it's a big change. <laughs> it's not too good to try to figure out where we're going. <laughs> <laughs> but but it is good to recognize that we're going through some huge changes here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I think one, one of the changes for me, I can only speak yeah. in terms of my own personal life, has to do with this understanding of uh, time that I was talking about. You know, um, when we realize that time isn't this uh, straight line that's pressing relentlessly forward. It isn't this thing that we have to race against. Time is the movement of our planet through space. You know, if the plan if our Earth were not spinning, we wouldn't have days and nights. If our Earth were not orbiting, we wouldn't have years. Yeah? Mm -hmm. um, and these things are cyclical. Mm -hmm. If the moon were not orbiting us, we wouldn't have months or moons as they were originally pronounced. A month is a month. It's the time the moon takes to go around us. Um, and when ancient people said many moons ago, they were not talking about a rock in the sky, they were talking about the movement of that rock around us. Mm -hmm. That is the cycle of a woman's womb, that is the cycle of the tides, it's, you know. So when we realize that time is not this straight line that we've got to race against, mm -hmm. rather that time is cycles, it's rhythms, um, those rhythms are like waves we can ride. Mm -hmm. uh, and when you're riding a wave, uh, you can get a lot done with a very little effort because the wave is propelling you forward. Mm -hmm. If you see time as this straight line that's pressing relentlessly forward, you're always racing against it mm -hmm. 
and um, that's exhausting. Mm -hmm. Natural time is empowering and enlivening. Mm -hmm. This clock time that we're working with or racing against is uh, exhausting, depleting, deadening. And the interesting thing is, speaking of science, I found out that this whole idea of, you know, the arrow of time, uh, that goes all the way back to uh, Euclid in the fifth century before Christ. The Greek geometer Euclid declared that the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. Mm -hmm. Remember we all learned that in 10th yes. grade geometry? Okay, so Euclid says the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. And Euclid's geometry is the basis of all science and, and Western thought. You, look, Euclid's book on geometry sold more copies than any other book except the Bible until the 19th century. Anyway, that whole idea that uh, a straight line is the shortest distance between two points is the basis of the arrow of time, and that idea is valid only on a flat earth. Mm. Because you the thought the flat earth was flat. <laughs> so the kind of time that we are racing against is flat earth time. Mm -hmm. In fact, the earth is round and the earth is orbiting. Mm -hmm. And what you call a year is actually an orbit, a cycle, and anything cyclical has this up and down quality to it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, in other words, waves that we can ride. The entire natural world is riding those waves. Mm -hmm. uh, animals know when to migrate mm -hmm. by the changing angles of light and the changing temperatures. And I just learned, for example, recently, reindeer eyes, reindeer eyes change color with the seasons. Mm -hmm. uh, they are in the wintertime, their eyes um, are able to see in the dark because where reindeer live, it's night for weeks at a time. Mm -hmm. And they can see in the dark because their eyes change in the winter. But that's their bodies riding these rhythms of time so effectively mm -hmm. that they can see just as well at the night as they can in the day. Anyway, I could go on and on. So yes, I know that's brilliant because that has so much implications. We yeah. try to fight so often in our life, or make it a certain way, or control it, or busy making the universe wrong, or life wrong, or God wrong for what happened to us. When really there is cycles. You're saying there are those waves to ride, and by just riding them, knowing and trusting, right. then there is something to harvest too at the bottom and at the top ev all the time. Exactly, exactly. By riding those waves, there's a harvest. That's what all farmers knew. Yeah. <laughs> you know, farmers know that if you plant your seeds at the right time, you're going to have a big harvest. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you don't plant your seeds at the right time, you're not going to have a big harvest, exactly. And we can use that term seeds metaphorically. Mm -hmm. The seeds of our ideas. <laughs> uh, <laughs> follow the same cycles as the seeds of a tree or a broccoli plant. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you plant your seeds at the right point in the cycle, they will uh, come to a nice big harvest. If you don't plant your seeds at the right time, you're not going to get much of a harvest, exactly. Mm. The, the Maya calendar actually describes that quite well. We're right now in the ninth wave. We're approaching the end of the Maya calendar. And they, they were astronomers, weren't they, on some levels? Yes. Yeah, the Mayans were the greatest astronomers we know of. I mean, they calculated the uh, orbit of the Earth to within, I don't know, one fifteenth of a decimal point to what we know today. Uh, yes, that's what they were tracking. And if you go to the Mayan pyramids, you see they are descriptions of the Earth's orbit around the Sun. They are embodiments. They embody all the information you could possibly want to know about the Earth's orbit around the Sun. Um, because time is a powerful cycle, a rhythm, a wave you can ride, but you've got to understand it. If you don't understand the wave, it can end up crashing over your head. I think many people experience anxiety attacks, for example, because they're going through a cycle, there's a wave building, but they don't know what it is, and, uh, you know, and so they don't get on it and ride it, and instead it crashes over their heads, mm -hmm. because any wave uh, if you don't ride it, it's going to crash over your head. I mean, that's basically the choice that we have. Mm -hmm. And it looks to me like m an awful lot of people have an awful lot of waves crashing over their heads, and the only solution is stuffing their faces with food or medication mm -hmm. to numb the pain from that. Mm -hmm. 
because we're working with this idea that time is a straight line. So we have no way to accept the fact that you really don't feel the same one day as you do the next. Mm -hmm. And yet we all notice that we go through these cycles. We're not the same people one day that we are the next, or even one minute to the next sometimes. Mm -hmm. But we don't have any way to understand these fluctuations. And so we try to damp the fluctuations by just stuffing our foods with faces with food, or drinking a lot, or mm -hmm. pharmaceuticals. But you can only stuff those, you can only stuff it for so long and it's going to erupt. Yeah. yeah. Like, 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 yeah, and, and the earth is really doing this right now. It feels like it's erupting, isn't it? It had enough. Yes, I think so. Yes, yes. Uh, a friend of mine was saying the other day, we were talking about the earthquakes. And, uh, and my, a friend of mine, my friend is a musician and he thinks in, you know, in, and he writes a lot of songs. So he thinks in those terms. Uh, and he was saying, gosh, if I were the earth covered with all that asphalt and pavement, I would just shake it off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How do we know that isn't happening? I mean, is inter any, anyone holding up a microphone to the earth and asking her how she feels about all this pavement? And how I'm interviewing her next. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> You're being a voice for her, too. <laughs> Ask her how she feels about all that pavement. She might just be trying to <laughs> shake it off, yes. you know, like a dog shaking off fleas or something, yeah. for all we know. Uh, as a matter of fact, you know, when my friend shared that with me, I remembered that I had read recently that the uh, tallest or one of the tallest buildings in the world is in Taipei. And I remembered reading in this little science news thing that comes to my emails every day that scientists discovered that that tall building in Taipei is actually causing earthquakes because there's so much weight pressing down at one small point mm. that it's actually causing mm. earthquakes in the area. Mm. So anyway. <laughs> Yeah. The earth has a right to uh, start uh, speaking out louder and clearer. It's painful to our lives, but we all collectively made it happen right now. If we're all here at this point, there's something that needs to happen and must happen. It's a living organism, yes. isn't it? I'm really discovering that being in Hawaii. I've heard of it, but now I'm really seeing it. Yeah. The earth is alive. Yeah, you really feel it here. You feel that the earth. Especially when you're li uh, living on a part of the earth that is erupting. I mean, this, is a, this volcano hasn't erupted uh, recently, but it shakes pretty often, and we know there's going to be another eruption. And when you're living on top of something that's moving around and is going to erupt again, mm -hmm. yeah, you really feel the earth is alive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. So let's take care of it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, thank you, Harriet, for this delicious moment. Thank you for taking the time, for having this joyful conversation, for bringing this new perspective to us all around the world. Aren't we grateful? <laughs> thank you. You're welcome. I love your question about the information from the sun. I'm going to be thinking about that for a long time. Mm. Nassim Aramai is uh, living in oh, Big Island. He speaks. Is he, yeah. Does he want to use that term? I think he's the one, well, a lot of them, but uh, he, he is, and I'm looking forward to interviewing him when I'm back in uh, October in Hawaii. Mm. Brilliant. Mm. He's brilliant. Oh, yes, I've seen his videos. Yeah, yeah, he's wonderful. <laughs> okay, wow. By the way, Alice is... Uh, oh, there's a beautiful... We can't see her. We can't see her on camera. She must be. I mean, she got up here. She doesn't should, we, should you show her? Sure. Come up. She'd like to make her film debut. Okay, then we'll... Silly. Yeah. No, I don't know. She doesn't like to be taken. Let's say hello. Oh, yeah. this is Alice Wong. Her name is Alice Wong. Hi. <laughs> yes. And she got a new pink collar. <laughs> no, she's not a lap cap. Except when I sit at the computer. She likes to sit at that chair, but uh, generally she doesn't like to uh, do laps. No, but that's fascinating about the information from the sun. Because more and more uh, scientists are thinking in terms of um, information as a, as a force... Yes. As a as a as a reality, not just as some kind of an abstraction. Mm -hmm. So it makes sense. Uh, yeah, yeah. Beautiful. Well, sending you much love, my beautiful Go Creators from Maui. This last week, actually, I've been here for five weeks, so now it's time to go back to the mainland soon and to then return. You know, you have to go through those motions, right? I'm riding the wave. <laughs> Great. <laughs> much love. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>